Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 303 for Monday, May 10th, 2021. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, or if if it's not your first time here, welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. How uh, how goes things, Mr. Kent? Things go good. It's um, it's an interesting time, you know. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Understatement of the One year. Is, yeah. Well, you know, I thought that there would be a, a kind of ramp to reopening and there was an initial surge of like planning and ideas and booking. But actually, I found like the past two or three weeks have been extremely quiet and not not a continued progression of that ramp. Yeah, I think it's going to be a, a staggered. It's not going to be a clean path. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I agree with what you're saying. I yeah. think the early adopters, if you will, <laughs> you know, to use a tech term, the early adopters <laughs> pushed Please. ahead and you know made some plans, put some stakes in the ground, said you know we're going to plan on on doing something. In the tech world, we call those the people that live on either the cutting or the bleeding edge. So perhaps the analogy is continually apt. So there you go. Yes. Yes. Um, but you know, a lot of the things we do, it takes they take some time to plan. You know, they take some time to, mm -hmm. you know, get permits and get police, you know, coverage and you know, sell booths and all these types of things. So I wonder if uh, the stagger is actually going to be. We did a little spurt up, but it's going to be a longer and flatter slow down, slope down, because you know, I, you know, th indoor stuff is still cooked for for at least until the fall here. Interesting. And uh, yeah, like, like I said, the outdoor stuff takes a little time. I actually, um, one of the chambers of commerce that holds a big event, um, they went to the town that they're in and asked for um, some assistance money. And sure. under the guise of, if they do a nice event in their town, it'll bring people into the town and those people will then shop and go to the restaurants. And so it's kind of like an economic stimulus thing. Yeah, yeah. And it, and they asked me to speak and just kind of talk about, you know, the return of live music. And it was interesting because I and I guess it's not surprising. The interest in doing things is felt deeply. The oh, yeah. willingness and caution is still quite high. Yeah. And so, you know, how are you going to socially distant? And some of the towns in this area have figured it out, you know, they're moving things from kind of a packed in smaller park to more of a dispersed area. They're, they're doing the thing where they draw circles on the ground and mm -hmm. allow up to three families, up to 10 people to make a reservation. Some of them have gone from free to paid and are not finding any, you know, problems with people paying. They're, they're willing to pay for the yeah, no friction there. The entertainment. Yeah. They're willing to pay for the, you know, for the social distancing. And so, you know, that model is kind of interesting that it's evolving. But like I said, it's been very, really quiet the past three weeks in California, or I guess I can judge Northern California and Central California. Sure. Um, that's Where interesting. I, I know um, on Friday, Nashville opens entirely like they, their social distancing restrictions go away at midnight. Oh, one on, you know, Friday morning, um, the, indoors and outdoors, indoors and outdoors masks. The mask mandate there stays in effect, which I found interesting. Uh, but their 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 justification for it is that that marks six days, six weeks, sorry, not six days. Six weeks from when uh, everyone was, every adult was able to be vaccinated. Now, whether people get appointments or not, I have no idea. I, I don't know enough mm. about the Nashville scenario, but that seems very, I mean, it, it, I, I get it. It makes sense. At some point we have to say, okay, like now this is on you to make your smart decisions. We're not going to nanny you anymore. Right. I mean, it, you know, at some level, okay, fine. Uh, six weeks seems like an aggressive schedule unless Literally anybody was able to get, uh, you know, their first vaccine on that day, um, which it, maybe it was. I don't know. But I found that interesting. So, yeah. But, yeah. And I was in. Well, the um, House Rockers are oh, starting. Um, I'm sorry. The House Rockers are. I'm, I'm heading up to do our first rehearsals. So our really first time full band in 15 months. Yeah. 14 months. So, you know, we're starting heading towards a June 21st, June 25th 
first gig, an outdoor gig at this brewery that we've played for, you know, 20 years. Sure. Um, they've just moved things outdoors. We have this kind of interesting June 15th date where the governor of California has said we're opening on June 15th. The really interesting thing about that is, and this came up in this in this town council meeting that I had to speak at, um, there's genuine hesitancy and skepticism about what that date means to anyone. So the government put it out there. Sure. You know, we can't enforce it on a local level, right? And, you know, the individual counties, you know, do most of the enforcement. Count, right? Counties and towns can be more restrictive than the state, just not less, I think, is is generally how That's that works, it. right? Yep. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's – and then, you know, Broadway is going to open in September. You know, think, so things have been thrown on the wall, but it really feels right now like there's not a ton of – uh, velocity. That, that's a good word for this. Yeah. You know, it doesn't feel like it's picking up steam where everything is going towards opening. It's very cautious. It's very, a lot of skepticism still, a lot of infighting about, you know, you know, what people will do once you let them go. Sure. With regards to personal responsibility and, you know, that type of thing. So it's a weird thing. I mean, I'm excited. We're going to get to play. We're going to see everybody. My band's all vaccinated and all in the right headspace to move forward. Yeah. Yeah, it's just it's we consistent headspace, one. right? That's what that's where everybody needs to be in the band, or that's it. Some yeah. level of consistent headspace, right? Yep. So I'll, I'll share a little bit about the prep, to getting ready to go into that practice uh, whenever whenever you're ready. But you were about to say something. Oh, I was going to say that I was in an arena this weekend. Uh, we sort of last minute decided to go see um, the Bruins play the Boston Bruins hockey team. For those of you that don't know, uh, play uh, on Saturday afternoon. And it's socially distanced in there. Everything. I mean, it's maybe 25% capacity. You know, they've got, I would, I would say more than six feet between every party. I could buy tickets in groups of two or four. And that was it. Um, and, you kind of get a row to yourself and there's no one behind you for a couple rows. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Every other row was empty. Uh, all the, at least in our section, all the even rows were uh, blocked, completely blocked off. And even in our row, uh, we had a block of four seats. There were six seats that of the, you know, our four was, were four of those six, but there were six seats that, that were not blocked off. And then seats were blocked off. I think, I think we could have had people on, we were sort of in the middle of a, a row. I think we could have had people on either end. We had people on one end, but not the other. I'm not certain that we could have had people on the other end. I don't, you know, I don't know, but, um, but it felt very safe. I mean, getting in and out of the arena, they were really managing the flow of people extremely well. You know, we, I mean, I've been to the Boston or the TD garden. I've been to the Boston garden too, but it doesn't exist anymore, but I've been to the TD garden um, many times. And so I kind of know what to do. I know where to go. And, um, you know, we went through the the metal detectors as you do. The guy scanned our, did our you have tickets. to show proof of vaccine? No, it's not that we had to answer a pledge that that basically asked if you're not vaccinated, have you been in contact with, you know, these right. types of people, you know, all of that stuff. And even if you are vaccinated, you still have to agree that you're going to wear a mask 100 percent of the time unless you're eating or drinking. And, you know, like all of that sort of, um, the, the, you know, that the guidelines that you would expect, the social distance agreements that you would do your level best to stay away from each other. Um, but even, you know, I had the guy scan my ticket and, uh, and then I just went to get on the escalator to go up cause that's what you do next. And, and there was a guy there that had like a paddle and he was like, please wait. And was like, Oh, yep. No problem. And there were, there was another family or whatever party of people that had gotten on the escalator and he made sure that they, you know, they got X number of feet away from the beginning of the escalator. And then he's like, okay, you guys are good to go. He's like, the four of you are together. I said, yep. And he's like, okay, all four of you may go. And, um, it worked out well. They, even in our section, like leaving and going into the concourse, they allowed no eating and drinking in the concourse, which I thought was really smart. Right. Because that's they have a full concessions. Um, pretty much full concessions. I mean, you know, remember there's 25% capacity there, yeah. So, but yeah, you could get what you wanted for sure. They were really smart about how they did it. You could order on your phone from your seat and then go pick it up so that there wasn't a whole lot of standing around. Um, they, they really were, were focusing it and they, they had signs that said, as you came out of your section into the concourse signs that said, stay in your neighborhood. So don't, you know, walk three sections around to go find the bathroom. You know, your bathrooms are this direction. Your concessions are this direction, which I thought was smart. It keeps people from, you know, overly encountering other people in a random way. Uh, it was very well done. I, I felt 
extremely safe there. I mean, we're all vaccinated and everything, but even still it was, I, I was really impressed with how they, how they did it. And I felt good about the That's whole thing. Good. Yeah. I wonder if, if it was interesting applauding PPE money. What's that? Say that again. Well, I'm just thinking about, you know, we're, we're kind of 14 months into this and you yeah. think of all the pro sports organizations that have had to do without ticket revenue. Right. And you just wonder, is that PPE money or is, does advertising carry the freight so much for professional sports that the, I that would, the ticket revenue is gravy? Yeah, I would, I've always assumed that for pro sports, in, in a general sense, the ticket revenue is gravy. Now, whether that money is actually spread around or not is a whole other question, right? Like how much does the venue get of the advertising yeah. fees, right? Like, but, but I, I, I think, in, I do think in the grand scheme of things, but hopefully somebody will tell us I'm wrong, uh, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. But I've always felt like that was gravy, but there is that the, I know a lot of venues have opted for the shuttered venues grant instead of the PPE uh, the payroll protection program, PPP, right? Yeah. Um, but instead of that, because it, for venues, it would it net them a greater sum of money to do the shuttered venue thing instead of the payroll protection thing. But, um, mm. but yeah, I, I mean, I would assume that there's some level of that because I, yeah, I don't think the advertising revenue like pays the salaries of the people in the venue necessarily. Right. right? Like that. I don't know. Who knows? I, you know, I know, I know the Bruins pay to rent the venue in some capacity, like a how, how that deal is structured. I don't know, but like, you know, when you're a band and you go play at the Boston, at the TD garden, you pay to rent the venue for the night. Right. And you know, and, and that comes That's with model. certain things. That's the model. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I'm assuming they have a similar deal with the Bruins, but it's probably a little bit different. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Homer's sure. Yeah. 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 So you got rehearsals though. We actually, we have our first fling rehearsal on sa on some Saturday too, but. Well, I'm glad to hear that because you yeah. were a little bit like fling may not fling anymore. Oh, I'm so. still, I'm still of that opinion. I think fling is, is in a, in a, uh, in a period of transition. Uh, we've been doing a lot of recording lately got a lot of our original tunes like fleshed out. I don't know how much fling will play live, but I think fling will, will move on and evolve as a, as an entity throughout this. So, got it. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, and I say this to everybody out there who's getting their bands back together after, you know, some kind of a hiatus. When we, when we were about a month or two into this and we was clear, we weren't going to play last summer. And, you know, we had our first band zoom. Yeah. Get confab. Right. I had said, you know, guys, I think it's going to be a while. And here's the thing. You know, we have, this band is going to continue. I'm I'm focused on having it continue. But when we come out of this, people may be in a different place. Um, you know, some of you may decide you don't want to play as much as this band plays. Some of you may move. Some of you, you know, may go take care of family or, you know, be with family. Something may happen. And all I ask is, give me plenty of time to deal with that, right? Like, so no, no surprises. If, sure. if it's starting, if it's starting to dawn on you that your situation is changing, because, you know, our band, and I think most bands work on the, on the basic uh, spoken or unspoken premise that everybody is in on board for the same thing. The number amount you practice, the amount you yep. perform, you know, the pay rates that are typically happen. I mean, there's, the, you know, you join a band and, you know, you either speak up and say, this is what I need to be a, a, a committed part of this band or the band leader leads you through what you can expect if you want to be a committed part yeah. of the band. Yeah. You have and a that, so, yeah, the baseline consistent sort of expectations all the way around. That's right. Yep. That's right. And, um, I haven't heard anything from anybody, but I do know this as we're going into rehearsals, I do, I know three guys in my band's um, overall situation has changed. And, um, you know, they they've they're, they're involved with other things that, that, you know, that they've actually all three of them have started other things. Right. And I, you know, I've changed. I've moved out of the area. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, I was just going to say you're one of them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'd, so I'd be the fourth guy. So, uh -huh. Things are different, and me as a worrier and a and a think two steps ahead type of guy, I just anticipate that you know when when people change, even despite best intentions, complications can happen, and then complications can cause complications. So, for example, if one of the guys who has started something else and they're passionate because it's their thing, sure. right? Um, if if uh, a conflict comes up. 
how how that conflict is handled and communicated and you know what's what's cool and i truly trust and believe everybody has got full uh, uh, you know all my guys are my guys because you know i trust them and you know they trust me and you know we have an, uh, you know a, a, a channel of communication right. for talking through things right but you know stuff happens and um how what happens when stuff happens is the weird thing i have built my band really to have hard emphasis on no subs so and and you know over the course of time and even took a long time with a lot of my horn players because my horn guys loved having a regular gig that was booking them and and giving them that much work but you know every once in a while they'd be like hey i haven't played a jazz gig in a while I, i i think i'll go play a jazz gig and you know it took a lot of years and a lot of conversations like you know you're in a band like people come out to see us they come out to see you 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 know you have fans yeah. and if every time this band gets on stage if it's a different makeup of people you know where it's a it's an inconsistent experience for those who want to follow us and want to you know connect with us and that has been my personal philosophy on this and that's something sure. i have really really pushed over time a lot of bands you know I, there are bands who uh, if you want us and you want a horn section, you have to pay X amount more. My band has always been, if you see the house rockers are playing somewhere, it's going to be a 10 piece band with a five piece horn section. It is that it is always going to be that. And yeah, as fair. much as I can yeah. possibly do it, it's going to be the same 10 guys. Right? right. Um, but it took a while to get to that point, but you know, we're getting to that point now where guys have other things. We're going to play a little less because I've moved out of the area and I've staked out the staked out the, the parameters of that, which means we're going to take the, most fun, average paying things, but we're really going to focus on trying to get more um, corporate gigs and wedding gigs. And, you know, it's going to yeah. become a financial tool to make it worth a three hour drive to me um, X amount of times per year. So it's going to take us from maybe 70 gigs a year. I don't know. I, I think I'll be happy if we play 50 gigs a year, but mo- but the weight of those 50 gigs are going to be are going to be corporate things. Right. Yep. Um, that, that's the goal. That's sure. the dream. Yeah, but that means there's time, and musicians don't like time; they like to play. And so we don't like get, downtime. That's right. Don't know yeah. downtime, right? Yeah. So they're going to get involved with other things, and and inevitably, things are going to kind of come up. And the law of unintended consequences is, as soon as we go down the path of one guy says, "Hey, I'm I'm not going to be able to make this gig. Go ahead and sub me," then the other nine guys are like, "Oh, I guess subbing is a thing now." Yep. And how much of a snowballing thing is that right so in, in a in a pro level you know you have your musicians on retainer and you know they're at your beck and call and you know that goes semi-pro level I, you know i'm not exactly sure how to describe that you know but we're somewhere around there and my basic premise was the amount of work that i would get you will be first call if you commit to making this first call for you right and i you know i don't know does that mean we have to end up someday at if you need to be subbed more than three times a year, maybe you're not first call anymore. You know, someone else who wants to be first call for a band of this amount of work. Yeah. I mean, you need to have some, I mean, you you could codify it as you're saying, or just have kind of a feel for it. Like if somebody, you know, if somebody subs out say three times, you have that conversation with them. Like, Hey, you know, uh, this is the third time this has happened in the last three months. Like if you're going to be doing this once a month, I get it. You know, you got your own stuff to do, but it sounds like maybe you've moved on from what we're doing here. That's a hard conversation to have when so much is up in the air, right? Not only is the band going to be playing less, but the band, the plan is for the band to be playing gigs, the likes of which the band really didn't play a ton of before. So if I were one of your musicians, I'd be like, okay, how is that going to happen? Like, I know that the other, the 70 gigs that those types of gigs I know that we know how to make those happen because they, they've happened before, right? Like there's, there's institutional knowledge. I realize 99% of it is probably in your head based on the conversations we've had over the last 10 years, 20 years. But you know, like this is now, Oh, we're going to be doing a different type of gig. I will tell you as a, a a person who has been in many bands, I've heard many bands say, Oh, we're going to move up (laughs) to the wedding band circuit, man. And very, very few bands ever make that transition. And it's a, it's for a variety of reasons. It's partially that the band itself is not really the the type of band that works in those scenarios and nobody really wants to change. They just want the money. And then the other thing is, you know, does the person who's handling the booking, the manager for lack of a better term, is that person have those contacts? Do they know how to do it? 
most wedding bands start out as wedding bands, you know, yes. and it's it's a mentality all the way around from, you know, band member to manager yep. and everywhere in between. And to fundamentally change that with if I were in your band, it would be a question that like I would be asking you, OK, why do we think that we how are we going to make this transition? Not why do we think yep. we can, but tell, like, let's talk about how, because it's going to be a very intentional transition. So with all so that, do me a favor. Yeah. Do me a favor. Delete uh, that segment. That, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, write that segment down a stone. We need to do an episode on okay. that. Like, yeah, that's such a great topic. Cause you're right. Everybody wants the money. Everybody, everybody <laughs> wants the job. Oh yeah. But can yeah. you get the job? Can you and do, can you the, do job? the job? That's yeah. Sweet. Yeah. It's a Joe whole versus different the thing. Volcano. It's Joe versus the volcano. <laughs> I know he can get the job. Can he do the job? Can you do the so, job? Yeah. That's, that's a good discussion. All right. The, the plan here. And again, I want to talk about the rehearsals. So in, folks in feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Know that that segment is coming. If you've been in that scenario, successfully, unsuccessfully, somewhere in the middle, tell us because we, that like, I, I don't have enough. I've never successfully seen that transition happen. I've never been involved in that transition happening. So I'm really curious to hear from y'all. So yeah. Feedback. Good, good, good discussion. So it, the way that it'll work for us is um, I will a year in advance, block out basically the tour dates that that I want to reserve. Okay, sure. And I know that I have enough of our public gigs to commit to those. And then, um, and so instead of it being every weekend, it's going to be, I think I've shared this with you before. My, my goal is one long weekend from January to April, two long weekends a month, May through September. Sure. Uh, and then undecided at the end of the year, but you really kind of holding on for corporate parties, which we do get Christmas parties. So, so we are, you know, kind of in there. So, so what I'm going to say is, you know, here's the calendar. These weekends are blocked. You guys with other stuff to do. These other weekends are uncommitted. I get it. Go do, go do you. And hopefully that works for everybody. Everybody can work around that schedule and accommodate both things. Cause sure. they have, they have a significant, um, interest in keeping the house rockers going as well. It's not like they're yeah. not like they want the house rockers to die. So right, hopefully right. that, that use of time will do that. So that's, that's the first plan is just manage a calendar effectively. Um, and, uh, and uh, so, so we're going into rehearsals now. And I, the only thing I really wanted to say about getting into rehearsals, you know, is um, sent out a really f structured plan. We're going to yeah. do these songs on this day, these songs on this day, these songs on this day, the whole show on this day. And then we're going to go play a show. And the, the, that's the thing really that's been smart. Most pleasant, go, sorry. Go, go ahead. Yeah. I want to, I want to, I want to just highlight that, but, but finish please. So the, the point I want to make for me is a, uh, I've been pleasantly surprised how much the muscle memory kicks in. So, uh, mm -hmm. we also have live recordings of us that, um, Steve, our bass player, chopped up into here's the here's the rehearsal one songs, here's the rehearsal. So we share those. So everybody has all the reference material they could possibly need. And um uh I have been pleasantly surprised how much the muscle memory for the playing has come back. I, you know, me again as a natural singer who really struggles on harmony and has to work really hard. I don't know if that muscle memory will come back. And, that, you know, I won't know until it's not quite the same singing to this, to the, um, no. to the audio no. files. I kind of got to feel what the other guys and where they are is the way it, it, it locks in from my mind at least. And so that's the one thing, one of the rehearsals that we have is strictly a vocal rehearsal. If we need, we'll schedule another vocal rehearsal. And, uh, but the playing stuff is coming back really quickly. And like, I, I think I shared a couple episodes ago, I've actually used the time to clean up a couple parts and, you know, learn the right parts or, you know, fix certain things that were always just like, eh, you know, I'll get to it someday. Now yeah. it's been the same now's day. The now it's someday. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I, it's I, coming together pretty good. I like your idea of having a structured plan. I mean, I think we could all agree that that's a great thing to have for any rehearsal at any time, pandemic aside, but returning to getting the band back together, like having that structure. We, we like I said, we have uh, the first, the first time the fling five will be in the same room together since March 12th of 2020. Um, so it, and, and I need to send, I need to start that trail. Like, okay, like it, it's fine if everybody chips in and we, which we will, but it's like, let's decide before we stand in the room, what songs we want to play so that if there's something we want to work on together, 
everybody's at least aware of it and can prep themselves like, like you're talking about doing here. Um, I, I, um, we got an, we got an email that I want to share because it's about this, but probably about an area of prep and rehearsal that many of us aren't thinking about. So I, I want to talk about that, uh, next, but, um, uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about our sponsor. If that, if the timing of this works all right for you, my friend, you go brother. All right. Hey, look, you know, as musicians, we like to buy a lot of gear. In fact, we talk about gear on the show. One of those things that stops us from buying gear though, is that uphill battle of paying off the debt that we already have, right? You have those high interest rates that result in minimum monthly payments, and they keep us in those endless cycles of debt. Well, our sponsor today, Upstart, can help get you ahead so that you can clear that out and then make those gear purchases that we all really like. Because Upstart is the fast and easy way to pay off your debt with a personal loan, and it's all done online. So whether it's paying off your credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or funding personal expenses, over half a million people have used Upstart to get simple, fixed monthly payments. And unlike other lenders, Upstart looks at more than just your credit score. So this is the key takeaway here. They look at things like your income and employment history, and that means that they can offer smarter rates with their trusted partners. And it's all done. You do a five minute online rate check. And what's cool about this rate check, and they'll tell you all this online, is that it does not do a hard pull on your credit. So it doesn't show up on your credit report for other lenders to see. Obviously, if you're going to go ahead and get the loan, then they would do a hard pull and, and the loan itself would also show up on your credit report, I assume. But you can do that five minute online rate check and you can find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash gig gab. That's upstart.com slash gig gab, G-I-G-G-A-B. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know that we sent you. Otherwise, they have no idea. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Again, that's upstart.com slash gig gab. Our thanks to Upstart for sponsoring this episode. All right. So this email says, <laughs> getting back to gigs again, we might have been practicing our instruments through pandemic, but I bet most of us haven't been practicing setting up and tearing down for gigs. Uh, and so it, and this was sort of catalyzed by in um, the last episode, I mentioned that I brought everything on my checklist to that bitter pill gig. Cause I brought, you know, my Cajon and our, the mixer and audio gear and all my drums. And, uh, and so, uh, as the email continues, what is your inventory for showing up at the gig? For example, for Paul, would it mean bringing two guitars and maybe an extra mic for Dave, two snares, Cajones, an extra symbol for something, not to mention stick bags and all that other stuff. It occurs to me that people have started to forget to bring reasonable inventory as they're getting back to performing live. I had a bass player come in with no extra strings, an amateur move, but I get it. And a drummer showed up without any sticks thinking it's a house gig and everything was provided again, an amateur move, but I'm not being judgmental. I'm merely saying it can be complicated to remember to have a checklist to bring to the gig and take home from the gig after a year and a half without and I only mention it because it's coming up a few times already uh, in, you know, in the last week or so. And he says, everyone that I've noticed has said it was a stupid mistake uh, and they were embarrassed by that fact. So how can we be gear ready, uh, bringing all the stuff we need, all the stuff we need to sound good and be comfortable, even if finances have not allowed people to have new versions of everything, just things that are in good working order. Helps you get the gig and helps you keep the gig. So, yeah, I um. So, this is not new to me because I've forgotten things for gigs before, Paul. Uh, my favorite one is the time I forgot to bring symbols to a gig, a three set night. Oh man, gosh. Thankfully I was able to borrow symbols from like, we were like two hours from home too. It wasn't, there was like no chance of going back and getting them. And, uh, and so I wound up borrowing some symbols, but it was, it was not good. And, um, uh, you know, that, that, that sort of stuck with me, but I didn't build a checklist until, I don't know, probably sometime in the last five years, I would say I had a mental checklist, but our brains are fallible. And, uh, and I found that, uh, my brain 
has has no surprise has fit the mold of most brains. As we get older, um, our brains get less, uh, our memories get less acute, and our ability to see the big picture gets better. Right, so yeah. I lean in on the big picture stuff because I'm better at that now than I used to be. <laughs> but <laughs> it comes at a cost. Thankfully, we have technology that can help with the things that our brains get worse at as we get older. Right, the the lists and all that. So. Um, so I'm happy to go through my list and, uh, and talk about some of my sort of not as obvious things. Uh, but, uh, but having that checklist before I leave for a gig, man, it like, this is, it's key for me. <laughs> so, you know, I hear this and, and actually there is, you, we actually should start with the big picture because, and I would just like to say, you know, you and I right here are doing a public service and that we are inviting Murphy's Law into every listener's <laughs> ears <laughs> right now. Of course. Right? So so the likeliness that uh, checklist or not, something weird will happen. Gu- you know, guitarists have a generally fairly easy. I bring two guitars. I have extra strings. I have extra batteries for my wireless. I have extra cables. I have started throwing uh, about a couple years ago. I've never had an amp fail, mm. but I have started throwing uh, one of those pedal board amp simulators into our sound truck just in case. So I guess That's I essentially smart. have, yeah, I essentially have a backup amp now. Um, and Simon does the same to a great degree. Um, I don't know what Russ does. I should definitely ask Russ. I know Steve is for a bass player. That guy has broken more strings in my mm. presence than I've ever seen a bass, but he always has extra strings or and I, you'll laugh at this. I don't think you're on the gig, but Steve is re- He's a monster. Ridiculously smart. Yeah. Well, he's a monster player and he's just a monster brain. Yeah. He actually has broken strings when he hasn't had replacements and he works out his parts around the missing strings, including like Tower of Power parts. That's amazing. Like, yeah, I don't know. It, it's a weird thing to watch. It's almost like you're watching a science fiction movie. You can kind of hear his brain going as he's as he's remapping Re, out. Yeah, transposing parts. this to different fingers <laughs> or different frets. Yeah, man. Yeah. So That's it's great. an amazing thing. Um, I don't think Steve brings a um, a backup amp, but uh, Steve has gone direct in some places. I was going to say, with a bass, you could definitely go direct, and and that would work fine in most cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. better Bill, maybe. It, yeah, Bill's. Um, you know, we have some redundancy in our mics. We've That's had good. wireless. You know, like you go into places where your wireless interference gets weird and you have to go to wire, you know, some wired mics or something like that. Mm. And so we've, we've had to do that in a couple of times. I do remember one gig where um, when we were using powered mains and uh, one of our mains blew a fuse and we were without mains mm. and we literally had to run up and down the street of this town. And we found a coffee shop that actually offered live music that had some mains that we, you know, I think we probably paid him to borrow his mains and he was really cool about it. You know, you can't, at this level, I don't think you can be redundant on everything. And, and Nick and the keyboards, luckily, he plays two keyboards, and both of them can be versatile enough to get him through a to get it through. You know, he may not get all the sounds and patches. Sure, but he can play the gig one. on just one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but yeah, mains would be the 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 biggest exposed yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, what do you What do you think about that? No, that it's true. I mean, you, I've I've certainly played gigs in my career where we've turned the monitors around to use as mains if there's right. been a problem with the main. You know, I mean, there's there's backups and then there's Plan B, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I've I've definitely done that. But like, you know, I mean, I have all of my drums and I I break it out in a way that I know I won't screw that up. So those are on there. Um, things that I put on there though shirt right because i generally mm. don't play in the shirt that i wear to the gig you know i'll wear like a t-shirt or whatever to set up but if i'm gonna wear something nice you know I'll, I, I have a shirt i have a mic stand on the list um i have my ipad on the list my ipad clamp which is equally as important as the ipad itself sure um my drum rug goes on the list because that for whatever reason will um will elude me sometimes um set list i put on the list uh i put this is going to sound weird but i put gig shades on the list i have i have glasses that i wear at gigs and i make sure those are in my bag i also make sure for outdoor gigs i have mosquito fogger on my on my list i have we have these little wow things right because i like it sucks being at a gig without one of those and it's super easy to grab 
Um, I forget what the, the thermocell I think is the name of the thing. Those are fantastic. Um, and if that's not the name of it, I will, I will fix it in the show notes at giggabpodcast.com, but I'm pretty sure it's suntan lotion for out there. Suntan lotion. Yep, exactly. Yep. Um, and then, you know, I have like, like I said, my drums and drum mics listed on there. I have my pitch slap and my pitch slap mic listed. I have for the, and I have it in sections. So I know, okay, if I'm not playing drum kit, I can ignore this section. Um, if I'm not playing the pitch slap, I can ignore that section. And then I have the mixer, the speakers and cable bags. If I'm in charge of any part of the PA and I generally, generally don't bring all of this to every gig, you know, um, I have my in-ears and my in-ears mixer, depending on how I'm going to, you know, get the signal from the board to my ears. Um, and then anybody that's played with me, knows that I have what I call my security blanket box. And this is a, it's like a little tub. Really, it's a, it's a file folder, like archive tub, which is a great size to throw all those things in that you, that I don't need at every gig, little tiny cables and adapters. Um, I have a, I have a, a thing that I actually haven't used in years. I think the last time I used it was a Macworld all-star band gig, believe it or not, Paul, but it's a little rolls box that takes a powered signal and breaks it down to a headphone output. So if I want to use in-ears and the place is only wired for a powered speaker, I can just grab the cable out of the back of the speaker, plug it into this, and I've got a headphone jack uh, that I can plug my ears into for that. Um, so th there's, you know, in, in that security blanket box has, it always has a couple of extra microphones in it. It's always got a few extra, not cables, but adapters. And like I mm. said, things, things like that. And it, all the things that you don't think you're going to need. And then at you, like every gig, you need one of them, you know? And, and so that little box has a, has a home in my, you know, in where I fit things in my car when I pack, uh, no Sweet. matter what gig I do, but yeah. Yeah. And then um, I guess for guitar players, we would add, you know, picks obviously, but all my gig bags have lots of picks in them. <laughs> I'm glad People. to hear that. I played with a guy in go figure, our guitar player in go figure. He never would bring picks to the gig, Paul. Now, I don't know that he knows this um, because I I got sick and tired of him being in the middle of a gig being like, hey, does anybody have a pick? I, I you know, I don't have any picks. <laughs> and it would drive. It was like, dude, we're playing these big shows like, you know, our, our crowds got pretty big with that band. You know, we, we, we were playing for, you know, a thousand people regularly and sometimes mm -hmm. more. And it's like, dude, you got to bring a freaking pick. So, um. I, I figured out what kind of picks he bought and I bought like a case of them and, uh, and I would, I would bring out a few at every gig. And when he wasn't looking, I would just toss them on the floor in front of his amp and so he'd always be like, Oh, cool. A pick. I need, I need, I forgot to bring picks. Like, this is great. I realized I was, I was, you know, supporting this enabling. behavior. I was enabling, yeah. but not the codependency. It was, it, yeah, but I, it, yeah. we were codependent. I was dependent on him having a pick to play his guitar. <laughs> like, if it was, it was codependent, whether I wanted it to be or not. So yeah. <laughs> Capos would be the other thing. Oh, right. Yeah. The capos are the things that get lost the most for me and, and actually finding, Finding the right capo that I can use on an electric guitar that doesn't, you know, pinch it out of out of tune. Yeah, there's ones that are have variable tension that you can have on the clamp, and uh, you know, the, to find the right one. It took me interesting probably six or seven brands of capos before I found ones that worked my guitars acceptably that I could, in the heat of a moment of a gig, just slap on, and I wouldn't have to worry about retuning. You know, it was it, it worked consistently the way it needed it to work. So capos would be a, a useful thing. And I use a capo on an electric guitar and maybe only one or two songs a night. Those are the things that tend to get lost. Those yeah. and sunglasses are the things that tend to get lost. They get put on top of the amp at the end of the night. And, and then they're I gone. Wrap them right away. Yeah, Correct. exactly. Yep. No, that, that's exactly it. And um, so it, it and um, he continued. He said uh, some of the production companies I know of. Uh, are doing full setup and teardown practice, full setup and teardowns, A, just to make sure they're in, you know, everything's in working order to check the inventory. And also just so that, you know, when you're setting up, it's not the first time you've done it in a year and a half at the gig. Well, I'll, I'll echo that, Dave, because um, the last of these rehearsals, when I said we're going to do a set of songs, we're going to do them in our normal practice place. Yeah. We're considering doing one rehearsal kind of semi-public and invite some friends along. But the last rehearsal where we're going to play the whole show, that's a full tech rehearsal yes. where we're going to go somewhere and set up all our stuff, you know, and I probably wouldn't have called that if it hadn't been 14 months since we've had to set up well, all that's our it. stuff. So yeah, 
Yeah, theater shows always do tech rehearsals, right? I mean, because every you have to, but it would be inadvisable not to because every right. show has some different requirements. You know, your requirements basically stay the same from show to show as do, you know, most bands. And but that idea of a tech rehearsal where you're like literally going through the motions of actually setting everything up, it makes yeah. You know, I sort of did that before the Bitter Pill gig. I didn't um set up all the gear, but I did grab the mixer and because we had never played with that lineup of Bitter Pill using my mixer, uh, I built the, you know, the the framework of what that set would look like. You know, how many inputs does each person have? I essentially did sure. all the the line set up here at home because uh, I could take an hour and a half and really like think about it and be like, OK. And knowing that there would be things that people didn't think of in advance. I left some extra room in different spots on the mixer, right. <laughs> right? You know, like those sorts of things, but being able to do that and then get to the gig and be like, okay, I have a picture in my head. Cause I did this yesterday of what needs to happen. Let me recall this preset. And, and now we can adapt from here as opposed to adapt from zero. Right. So, um, and really just refamiliarizing myself with the, like how the gear works. It was like, Oh yeah, I remember how this is. Like, I definitely remember how to hold my drumsticks and play those, but you know, <laughs> messing with the mixer, it's like, Oh, this has been a long time. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So we'd love to hear what's on your gig ch checklist too. Uh, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Make sure to, uh, make sure to let us know because I'm sure we forgot things. Oh, one of my favorite things to, to not forget is food. Water. Oh yeah. yeah. Water and food. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Cause if you're, if I have to get to a gig and there's not food provided um, and I'm there for a long time, I, you know, you don't want hangry Dave on your gig. And so I try to go out of my way to not be hangry Dave. <laughs> Tempos are fast on those. Nights. <laughs> That's right. Let's get out of here. <laughs> I got food to eat. Where's our burger? Yep. <sighs> All right. That's what I got for today. You got anything else, man? No, here's, I, I just want to tease this one other thing. So, yeah, man. I've been thinking about the acoustic stuff I did, and I do. And I just want to talk a little bit about the people who can do uh, uh, quiet, moody music. Like, mm -hmm. where do you play that, right? You know, dance music you can find a place for. Um, you know, music that you want people to listen to and, you know, catch the nuance. And, you know, that, again, I don't play very well in a restaurant when there's clanking plates and I have to kind of get over the din of people talking. So if you want, if your art is... Talking, you know, playing, uh, you know, moody music. I want to kind of talk about where where are good places to play that, and who's successful, and and what is the uh, approach to doing that. Nice. Not a lot of places to play play that type of music. Yeah, I agree. I yeah, that's a yeah. I, I look forward to having that conversation. Cool. Well, that's what I got. Are we all good? All right. All Looking right. forward to the wedding band talk too. Yeah, same. Thanks for listening, folks. Again, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We're looking forward to hearing from you. We'll share your stuff on the show. We'll talk about it. We'll dedicate a segment to it like we did today. Always be performing, Dave. Always be performing, Paul. Have a good one, man. Late. Late.